Article 4, Section 4 of our Constitution, of the U.S. Constitution, is the Guarantee Clause. And it says that the U.S. government guarantees a Republican form of government in each of the states of the Union. The Republican form of government is something that is uh, subject to much interpretation. Some people say presently, gee, that means that we shouldn't have direct democracy, for example. Congress wisely hasn't touched that one. But uh, it's largely a clause, Article 4, Section 4, that has fallen into disuse for, uh, to address problems with uh, the democratic process. Since the Reconstruction Amendments were added to our Constitution, we tend to uh, hit up the, particularly the Equal Protection Clause to um, address issues of the de with the democratic process. Um, such like uh, uh, stuff that Steve's working on now with the Voting Rights Act. But this clause in our Constitution was picked up and added to the constitutions of several other federal systems around the country, or around the world, um, including Argentina. And they have used this clause as justification for essentially setting aside uh, the outcomes of democratic processes. So the federal government has the authority to intervene in provincial governments, set aside democratically elected state uh, provincial legislatures, sometimes the whole judiciary, and put in place a federal manager. So the same words, the same text, plays out very differently from one context to another. Another uh, example of rules behaving differently from place to place. On the plane ride over, I was, um, probably many of you saw this article in the Times, uh, the Turkish Prime Minister, er er Erdogan, how do you pronounce this? Erdogan. Erdogan uh, says, I've got an idea. How about make me president? Right? <laughs> now, the response in Turkey is that this is you know, leading to authoritarianism, that he has ambitions to be an autocrat. In October, I gave a talk at Oxford and on the plane right over, read an article about Tony Blair having an idea that we ought to have in the EU a democratically elected president. Um, and this, a similar idea, right, this kind of transition to, in the one case, a more lively presidential system, and the other one, introducing a presidential system, instead of being seen as Tony Blair's autocrat, it's like, ugh, this is just amusement. This is a guy who's out of a job, needs something to do, but it, it wasn't seen as a threat. So we, uh, um, when we design rules or institutions, <laughs> We have in mind a behavioral change that we think will result from that rule or that institution. And when it goes awry, when it doesn't work the way that we planned for it to work, often we blame, and if we run through the usual suspects as gave various you know, information issues, uh, we blame culture. So here, one of my colleagues, Ron Englehart, has done his best to survey cultures around the world, right? He's gathered empirical evidence of the existence of distinct cultures by uh, putting in place with a huge army of collaborators um, surveys where he asks people around a, a long a battery of questions to gauge, which he then, through factor analysis, breaks down into two dimensions. To what extent is this a population that's focused on just getting by, survival, uh, versus kind of uh, moving up that Maslow's hierarchy to enlightenment, I suppose, right? Um, and then on the other axis, uh, to what extent in terms of the way that they're structured, the organization of the government, is it traditionalistic, very hierarchical? Or is it more secular, less presence of religion in the government, uh, rational authority? Okay, this, uh, and then we're able to discern clusters. Here's Northern Europe, North America. It looks like the US, through one, from one battery to another, made some progress on secular rational authority. Uh, but then we have Africa sitting uh, a lot lower in this, um, in this, uh, uh, 
along these axes. So we can compare places like Sweden and Zimbabwe, and even though there's a heck of a lot of diversity within that population, we can talk about these cultures as being distinct. So when we talk about culture, how do we talk about it? Well, there are those uh, who are out in the field and, and uh, engaged in, in what here to call fit description, right? So this, we can uh, identify cultures as being monogamous, uh, do they practice progenitors, their crop rotation, is this the influence of the big man? Um, there are those who, like Ron, takes from that, tries to take an aerial view and categorize or classify these cultures. Then there is the, uh, this more game theoretic approach, or theoretical approach, where we classify cultures as behaviors such as, does this society tend to behave selfishly or cooperate? Do they punish in, in a game that we study? Is their typical offer in an ultimatum game something like $4.20? So what I'm going to do today is give you a background, think about the way that Scotty and I have been thinking about culture and games, which is along that, um, that last line of terms, introduce this idea of the study of sequentially introduced institutions, which will help us understand this interaction between culture uh, behaviors and institutional path dependence. I'll give you an example. Somewhere in the midst of this, I'm going to let Scott stand up and earn his plane ticket. Um, and then uh, we'll relate it back to some stuff that you might be familiar with, the uh, Greif and Leighton's uh, work on um, endogenous institutional change. The essential idea that Scotty and I have been working on for like 10 years now is that people play multiple games simultaneously. So when we do our analysis of the way that people respond to a, a rule or a set of incentives, is that maybe what we're doing is partially equilibrium analysis if we're just looking at one independent game. And there may be an argument for thinking about these games existing in context, in a broader institutional context, <laughs> And that, therefore, the way that an agent responds to one game is, in some ways, a function of the other games that that agent is playing. Just pictorially, this is what I'm talking about. Here's an agent who has uh, some interaction with, say, the law and government, uh, her family and spouse, and the environment, and the economy. And each one of these institutional environments probably has multiple institutions as well. So this larger project, we relate, we try to understand institutional performance as a product of culture. But also, that culture is a product of the institutional environment. So how does that work? Well, in this multi-institutional setting, there is a behavioral response to one institution that, at times, can bleed over through what we call behavioral spillovers to affect the way that an agent re responds to an entirely distinct set of rules. And uh, so these uh, two papers so far that we've published in this project, um, most recently an experimental study that came out in games, where we found that uh, uh, there is significant spillover effects in for certain categories of games. And so what we were able to do in that paper is talk not just about the existence of these behavioral spillovers, but make predictions about which games will spill over and affect which other games, and um, in what direction that spillover effect will take. That is, how will it shift behavior in that other game? So what we're going to do today is talk about sequentially introduced games. In that earlier work, it was uh, a horizontal context, if you will, games introduced simultaneously. Now we're saying, is there such thing as institutional path dependence? That is, does the order that games are introduced affect the way that agents respond to those games? And if so, can we develop a theory that would help us predict when it might happen and when it won't happen, and what the outcome will be. 
we'll have these institutions arrive in sequence. Individuals will choose individuals uh, initial strategies. Um, oh, sorry, this isn't stupid. Uh, they'll choose an initial strategy that is uh, um, in the first game that is payoff maximizing. But thereafter, some of the individuals will uh, use heuristics, or they'll apply what, the, uh, what they did in the first game to a subsequent game. Um, and they'll learn equilibrium strategies, so they'll, we'll introduce these, these institutions in, from one epic to another, but then within each epic they're going to play the same set of games over and over again, so they'll have the opportunity to learn uh, strategies within each epic, um, and uh, uh, using best response dynamics. Okay, so here's what it looks like. These are games, not that uh, we're studying in this paper, but these are the ones that we used in those previous papers. So we looked at uh, family games that are all related to the prisoner's dilemma. So let's say in Epic 1 uh, that we um, introduce subjects to a prisoner's dilemma in this next epic, and so they, they played that a lot until they arrived at some uh, equilibrium behavior. Next epic, they're still playing PD, then we introduce a game that's closely related to the PD, but where the payoff maximizing behavior is actually on those uh, diagonals, the off diagonals, so you win, then I win, you win, then I win. When we saw that in the lab, it was incredible to see people, sometimes they got to this, behaving in this alternating uh, way. Um, and if they get there, that maximizes their payoffs. It's still, uh, they still have positive payoffs if they cooperate with one another, so they play all C. Um, but uh, if they manage to alternate, it, uh, they do better. And then another game, self-interest, where uh, the dominant strategy is what well, we call it uh, de facto, but it's uh, uh, just to be consistent with the other games. But it's, um, you don't need to worry about what the other players are doing at all. Okay. So these three games. Actually, what I'm showing you right now, we ran some experiments. We haven't published this yet, but this is um, uh, the results of some experiments. So the first epic, we set up uh, in one treatment, players playing PD. Well, what you should notice first, by the time of the third epic, they're all playing the same set of games. Okay. The difference is in what order were these games introduced. So in the first epic, uh, some, one group is playing PD, another group is playing that self-interest game. It's very easy to solve. This is a game where the, no, almost nobody screws up. Right? Okay. Um, PD, as we know, uh, they, it, experimentally, they don't get it the same way that we as game theorists get it. Um, but they, they do quite well. Epic 2, uh, in the first half, PD, and then we introduce ALT. Second half, self-interest, and then we introduce ALT. So here the question is, is there a difference in the ALT behavior? Right? And then by the third epic, they're all playing the same games. But the question is, is there any variation within each game in the way they play? Right, okay, so what did we find? We found that um, all, they didn't all cooperate. So this, this little superscript here is indicating the uh, behaviors. Okay. They didn't all cooperate in the prisoner's dilemma, but that is the, uh, the uh, plurality response. Self-interest, super easy game, we don't even need to talk about it, was an um, LD. In the second epic, though, here, continuing to cooperate in the prisoner's dilemma, notice the difference in alternation. The A is an alternating behavior. Okay. C, cooperating. When alternation was paired with prisoner's dilemma, they cooperate. When it's paired with self-interest, actually a lot of them defected and just blew it, but, um, but they were more likely to alternate than they were in this treatment. So here we see what we call set dependence, okay? where uh, the way that you play in one game is a function of the other games in your set, the ensemble of games that you're playing. And moving on to the third epic, by the time they're playing the full round, we see continuation of cooperation for alt and continuation of alternation for alt. But notice this completely wacky thing that they're doing in PD. They are alternating. 
between the sucker's payoff and the, the every, you know, why am I blanking on that? Temptation, right, right, where you, you get away with exploiting the other person. We don't always see that in the lab and in Prisoner's Dilemma. Uh, we would never expect that. Um, and yet we see that here because of this path dependence, introducing the Prisoner's Dilemma after they've already played Ultimation. All right, so what we'll do today is simplify the, the um, uh, class of games. Um, and the results that we'll get out of this is that we're going to see that behavioral spillovers can produce suboptimal strategies, just like we were seeing with our experiments, right? Um, we'll show, uh, we'll establish through a claim that path dependence will happen if inevitable in the sequential introduction of games unless all of the institutions are insulated. And we'll define that later. Um, some of these games are more susceptible to path dependence and suboptimal play than others. So it isn't going to be the case that all games are affected, and we'll be able to describe which games will be affected and which won't. Um, this is quite interesting. The uh, most efficient paths of play, that is the path maximizing paths, are, uh, tend to have very diverse early games. And we'll show you why that is the case. And then relating this uh, back to the, um, the way that Greg and Layton have been thinking about institutional change, if you have slow drift of an institution, and uh, you know, for those of you familiar with their paper, they have these quasi-parameters that are slowly changing the values of, of uh, uh, actions. Well, the consequence of, of this slow change is that um, shifting the institution, shifting the play within an institution happens at the very last possible moment. And so that will be inefficient. So in this model, we have, just like uh, those two by two games I showed you earlier, just two actions, A or B. Uh, we have a set or family of games where theta it determines the payoff structure of the game. So theta, I'll show you in a second, is something that we use as a, a, a key tool in relating the similarity of these games. And this theta exists on some interval. Um, the payoffs to playing A, uh, given theta, are decreasing in theta, and, and payoffs to playing B increase in theta. So what we can get there is this nice single crossing property that we um, are able to exploit where uh, one, on one side playing A is efficient and then as theta grows there's a threshold of efficiency and then playing B becomes efficient. So that theta I said, so what we're, uh, we need to, in this, um, we need a way of thinking about, of relating these games to one another. And so we do that through this theta. By having this theta, we're able to exploit this Euclidean distance between games, just based on, on shifting the value of theta. So then we can talk about one game as being closer or farther away from another game. And then uh, we also introduce this gamma term, a spillover parameter. So we divide our population uh, into two types of players. Those who are rational and just are able to see the full consequences and immediately adopt the payoff maximizing action. And those who, what we call heuristic learners, those who grope around a little bit, and the way they grope is they start by playing uh, the action that they played in the game that's most similar to this new one that they're playing. Now they still, uh, in these series of rounds, can uh, um, change their play, but this is where they start. Okay, so as I said in the initial game, all agents play the efficient strategy. In subsequent games, uh, some play uh, this uh, efficient response and other payoff maximizing response, and others use this heuristic, and then they learn to play equilibrium um, using best response. Uh, and then the last definition, path dependence. 
a sequence of games produces kappa kind of behavior if, if there's a permutation in the sequencing of games such that uh, uh, the play in at least one of those games would differ because of that sequence. So here's an example. So in this game, you can see how the payoffs, if they're coordinating their actions, A or B, is a function of theta. And then on the opposite, uh, it uh, is not a function of theta. Okay, so what you notice here is as theta increases, uh, the value of playing A decreases, like I said before, um, and the value of playing B increases. So again, relating this, because we're really very much inspired by Bradford Lincoln's paper, this is, you can think about this as being like their quasi-parameter, right? That um, uh, can shift and uh, change the value of the play. All right, so what we have here, given, given this, is this threshold of efficiency that I was describing before. So as theta grows, uh, for half of that interval, a, playing A is payoff maximizing, and for the higher half of that interval, playing B is payoff maximizing. And another uh, way that we can divide up this uh, theta interval, and this is really the, the key point of our paper, is that given this gamma term, which is the proportion of our population who are these heuristic learners, we can use that to solve for um, these breakpoints, which define this interval into three sections. One section where the uh, institution, here uh, indexed by theta, is immune, that is, they will arrive at the payoff maximizing play, and uh, an intermediate region where it's susceptible susceptible to uh, 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 the other games in context uh, and uh, therefore the um, influence of these heuristic learners. So an example here. Let's start with game one where theta is seven. Now remember our efficiency threshold is eight. So anything less than eight, the efficient play is A. Anything above a efficient play is B. So in game one, uh, theta uh, will be seven, and the outcome is going to be everybody plays A. Um, game two, theta is 15. So we're going to add an institution, this institution where theta is 15, and uh, see an outcome of all B. Game three, we're going to add a theta of nine and see what happens. So here we have theta at 7, and the play, the outcome of play is A, right? It's to the left side of the thre um, efficiency threshold. Then we add our second institution, theta at 15, and this is in that uh, immune section, so it's not uh, subject to the influence of what happened before and the behavior, uh, although the heuristic um, learners initially start by playing A, they uh, conclude those rounds um, and in equilibrium finish by playing B. So the question is, once we introduce this theta, at, this game at, with a theta of nine, what the behavior is going to be? Now bear in mind, here's our, our efficiency threshold. So the efficient behavior would be B. So bear in mind that our heuristic learners are, so the, the rationals are going to play B here. But the heuristic learners are saying, gee, what game is most similar? So that, because that's their starting point. And so they start by saying, well, game uh, with theta 7 is a lot closer than game with theta 15. So their rule is, I'm going to start by playing A. And then given best response dynamics and the 
uh, um, payoff structure, those uh, rationals are going to coordinate their behavior with the heuristic learners in this realm. It wouldn't happen in the immune realm. So this, I like this because this illustrates two points. First, that we're getting suboptimal play. Okay. And second, that the order of the introduction of these games matters. So we set up a, this claim. Any set of games with at least one susceptible game, one in that susceptible interval, and that interval is defined by the, a combination of the payoff structure and the gamma. So with at least one susceptible game and two games that have different efficient outcomes can exhibit path dependence. And the proof of this is really easy, right? So uh, if we have uh, game A, a game where A is efficient, game B, a game where B is efficient, and game S, a susceptible game, right? If you have a combination first uh, game A and then game S, that'll yield A and A. Game B, game S yields B, B. So increasing the spillover effect doesn't necessarily lead to more path dependence, but it will lead to more sensitivity to initial conditions. And let me show you, um, so for example, here we have the interval uh, for that initial gamma that I set up, which really was 75%. Um, of 6 to 10, but if I increase that gamma, that interval grows of the susceptible regions. <clears throat> One other thing that we need to be thinking about here is a, a threshold, not the efficiency threshold, not those cut points, but the other, uh, another one that these agents are using, these heuristic learners are using, in order uh, to decide um, what strategy to play, how to respond initially, right? Such that if, so we have this threshold, such that if um, beta is less than that threshold, they play A, and otherwise they play B. And this threshold is a function of the games that have been already played. But for that threshold, the, um, uh, uh, where does it end up after, I think this was 200 rounds of, of uh, play. Right. So that threshold, you notice um, here the uh, susceptibility interval ranged from 0.2 to 0.8. And we see that uh, about 25% of the time, I think it was, that uh, um, cut point that agents are using ends up um, out on the uh, extremes. Right. And the other thing to notice is that it doesn't tend toward the efficiency point. So what this means is that most of the time, agents are not engaged in efficient play. Okay. I'm here for tax reasons, because we both have to present we can't get our um, subsidy. <laughs> no, so the quick thing here is when this is at point two and point eight, you see that there's this is 200 runs. So basically half the time is genocide, 25% or 25 times and 30 times, you get point eight and point two. And then you get stuff in the middle. When you push them out to 0 0.05 and 0.95, you get that over half the time you end up at the extremes. And the reason why is you've got a huge susceptible region. So whatever you get first, like if you get a B, that means the next time you almost certainly get something in the susceptible region. And so you end up getting all Bs. Okay. So how do you do this generally? So generally, if you sort of one dimensional case, the paper's actually more general. So you can ask questions like, given a set of thetas, is there a sequencing that produces an efficient outcome? So one thing you could ask is, suppose you want an efficient outcome. So we're coming at this from a mechanism design standpoint. The mechanism design, the whole question is, how do you get efficient outcomes? But Jenna's initial point was that we often, what we're really doing is partially delivering analysis. We're only considering one institution. But what if you thought about there being multiple institutions and people's initial strategies being a function of what they played in the past? Now we assume case phase, but Bob, we could also assume maybe they're going to play what they played in the previous institution. Right? That would be fine as well. It's a different assumption. But the point is, is that could you get a sequence? So what you can do is you can basically say, here's a set of games, and a path is going to be susceptible is if I play this thing up to this point, the outcome I get is not efficient. And basically what you need to be the case is that um, if and only if like, the leading right, doesn't belong to the susceptible path. So how do you prove that in the context of a class of games? Can you just do that? Yeah. So basically what you're saying is that 
I can define a set of susceptible paths as the paths that would sort of mess me up, right? And you can only get efficiency if somehow the set of paths leading into this game don't mess me up, right? That's the uh, result. Like, that's the sort of general abstract result. To prove that in the context of any set of games actually isn't that hard. So let's take a one-dimensional set of games and let's have a thing to be the sufficiency threshold. So in Jenna's example, this is the eight, okay? I can relabel the games as the ones that are less than the threshold and bigger than the threshold. Then I label them sort of alpha one, alpha two, up to alpha m, and then beta one, beta two, beta. So the alphas are going up, the betas are going down, right? Now, what you can do is, um, given a set of games like this, okay, alpha one, alpha two, alpha m, beta k, beta two, beta one, any sequence of games where I take something from further out first leads to greater efficiency than if I take something closer in first. Does that make sense? So suppose I had a theta equals 15 and a theta equals 12. I'm better off doing the 15 before the 12, regardless of the rest of the sequence. Does that make sense? So, um, and then you can prove I won't go through it because we're late on time. You can basically prove something called an index. So here's the idea. So I've got that alpha one equals four, alpha two equals seven. So the first one's immune. The second one, I'd like to get an A outcome, but it's in the susceptible region. I've got this game, this beta game is 8.5, which is also in the susceptible region. The index for this game, too, says, how many of the B games can I introduce before I introduce this? And still get the efficient outcome. The answer is zero. I can't introduce any. And so basically, the way the theorem works is you can basically look at sort of the index of each one of these games, right? and ask if the index is large enough that I can keep pulling an A game, a B game, an A game, a B game from the extremes in order to get efficiency. So sort of as a benchmark, the way to think of this is I take the most extreme A game, then the most extreme B game, then the next most extreme A game, the next most extreme B game. However, I may want to violate that if it turns out I've got a, a bunch of really extreme B games. I might want to pull those in first. So it comes down basically to the distance of the games. Okay. One last thing on the... Uh, this theta is dimension, this is the quasi primary stuff from Greif and Leighton. What's interesting here is that they talk about, you know, if you think about our framework, certain theta are going to be susceptible, some are going to be, and they think about, like, there's a theta that starts out at 5, then it moves to 7, then it moves to 9, and then eventually moves to 9.5, then it moves to 10, and then it becomes B. So the interesting thing that they don't talk about, at least as far as I can tell in their papers, is that they talk about this being institutional change, but what they actually get, if you think of Marx is when you get institutional change, it's sort of way beyond what it would be efficient to do so, right? It's at this point in our framework where the, um, you've, you've gone with the immune region of the other game. Okay, so some quick takeovers. The larger behavioral spillover implies a larger susceptible region, right? Um, larger susceptible region implies more initial sensitivity, right? So in some sense, what games would previously matter more, but a lot less path dependence. Right? So if there's a huge spillover, you sort of get on a train and you go to all your life. Efficiency requires clear incentives early, right? So that's that theorem that like in order to get the good outcomes, you've got to start really with these extreme games. And um, then this other kind of, the outcomes are always at least as good as stronger incentives early, so you can't do it. So, okay. And then uh, um, one last point, the um, and I'll stop, is we're mostly through then, you can say, okay, we just did genocide, this one example of one game, we've got the theorem for the one parameter games. If you take all two by two symmetric games, that's a three parameter family of games, and now you're just in a three dimensional space as opposed to a one dimensional space, and you can do the same thing. But instead of having a single index, you've sort of got three, there's only three possible games. You can play this corner, this corner, you can alternate, and you can basically sort of do the same thing, but you get the same result. You want to come in from the extremes. So the same sort of logic holds. If you want to get, Efficient behavior in the future, you've got to start with games that create very, very clear incentives. And I think that, um, you know, I started this by, by showing how I care about constitutional design and this, when we write these constitutions, what are we doing? Are we having an effect? But all of us care about social programs or, or have a sense of when uh, uh, things don't work out exactly as we plan. And an implication, I think, of what, what Scotty are, and I are onto here is. If you think about this, say that, that institutional drift, and we, we might think about if we want to move a population in a certain direction, say introduce democracy, um, that we might want to 
design an institution that fits really well with their existing culture, that was, it, it, that's an in, intuitive way to respond to that. But an implication of this that I really need to think through more is, no, you don't want to offer an institution that will just move them incrementally. Because that can lead to this inefficient play. Instead, you might want to blow their doors off with something that's totally different and takes them out of their comfort zone and uh, tries to generate a completely new behavior.